We've been talking about something, and a little coach came on our screen week before last and told us something. You remember? You need a life coach. <laughs> and so many people ask, well, what is a life coach? I wanted to ask, where have you been? There are over 150,000 of them in the world. There, there are all kind of life coaches everywhere, so I thought we might have go back and just define what is a life coach. Look at the definition. A personalized helper who will partner with you in designing your future. Life coach. Somebody who will partner with you in designing your future. By the way, I want you to take what I'm saying personal. Would you do that? People, uh, no, no, no. This is just for you. Nobody else. We were just sitting down together. You were there and I was here. And you say, all right, I'm going to speak just with you. Don't let it bounce off. Don't stiff arm me. So we come to the point, if anybody is semi-honest and semi-candid and in any way wants to move on up in life, you and I need a life coach. Now, we got a lot of coaches running around, a lot of life coaches. Uh, Tony Robbins is a life coach. Made over $30 million last year. Hmm, pretty good. Dreyer is a life coach. He writes written a lot of books, some good books, some good material, absolutely. Dr. Phil is a life coach. You better bring your big wallet. <laughs> He's a life coach. Talked to a lady recently. The Dalai Lama has coached her. Oh, my goodness gracious. You must have big bucks. And she did. There, there, there are all kind of life coaches. You know, the leader of every, every religion, every denomination, every religion, they, they're, they're life coaches. They'll tell you this is how you live, this is what you do. All kind of books running around, some under the Christian banner, some under the secular banner, some under the New Age banner, some under the Buddhist banner, some under all the banners. A lot of coaches. A lot of coaches running around. And we need a life coach. Now, let's say you're an atheist. And you decided, well, I need a life coach too. Who's it going to be? Well, if you're an atheist, let's say that you could find someone who was prior to history. Or words, someone who had a life prior to the dawn of time. And let's say this same person lived in history. And this same person now lives outside of history. In other words, they are infinite. They are eternal. Would that person make a good life coach? You see, they would see everything. Past, present, future, in timelessness. Wouldn't that be a terrific person to sit down with you and leave out all the God, Christ, salvation stuff for a moment? If you're an atheist, wouldn't that be a super individual to sit down and mentor you or mentor me? Do you think you and I would make better decisions about life if we lived 200 years in the future and we could look back on the present? Boy, we'd have a whole new perspective, wouldn't we? Everything we think is important may be silly. Everything we think silly may be important. It could turn our whole lives around, could it not? If we had an eternal, infinite perspective. Boy, to find a life coach like that would really be something, wouldn't it? That's somebody I'd want to coach me. That's somebody, if you had a scintilla of intelligence, you'd want to coach you. Now, we say, well, what does it take? I want to enter into a pact, a P-A-C-T, with a life coach. So we ask the question, what would you and I look for in a life coach? First of all, I think we'd look for power. We would look for somebody who was powerful. They had gravitas. They had meaning. They had demonstrated their power. Somebody who is 
powerful. Then I'd look for somebody that's authentic, wouldn't you? Nobody that's playing games, that's phony, that's exploiting you or exploiting me as their coach. They're authentic. They're real. And I think I'd want somebody who is caring. They care about me. They're interested in me. I'm important to them not only what I might do for their team, but even when I'm offside and when I'm holding, when I break training, they still care about me. Boy, I'd want a life coach like that, wouldn't you? I want a life coach who's a teacher, who really knows how to teach. And what they teach is absolutely the perfect curriculum for me. Isn't that it? Folks, can, you can have a lot of subsets of this, but that's it. You want to enter into a pact with somebody who is a powerful, authentic, caring teacher, right? But wouldn't that be great? And then you've got to flip it over. You've got to ask the question, well, where do you find such a person? I want to read to you a passage that most of us are familiar with, but I'm going to sort of emphasize some words. If I could, I'd stand up on those words and shout them, but I'm going to emphasize them. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 following. And Jesus was setting out on a journey. A man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus seeing, do you recognize me as divine, as Messiah? See, no one's good but God alone. See, he's, see do you know uh, who you're talking with, with whom you're speaking? You know the commandment said, Jesus, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And this rich prodigy, leader, young, he said to Jesus, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up to this present day. Whew, man, what a guy. Looking at him, verse 21, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack. And the guy said, hey, I lack only one thing. That's pretty good. I mean, I'm going to join up. I mean, this is something, one thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And at these words, he, this rich, prestigious, wonderfully gifted, moral young man said, he was saddened and he went away Grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And the word grieving there is a picture of a woman in labor delivering a child. That kind of pain. He went away grieving because he owned a lot of stuff. Hmm. And Jesus said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were amazed at his word. You see, in that day, like some people today, wealth is a mark of God's blessing, is a mark of somebody who is superior. It's a mark who's someone who's got it all together. See, same thing in that day, only more so. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they were more astonished. And they said to him, then who in the world can be saved? And Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but with God all things are possible with God. How in the world? Now, we've heard this verse explained away like the eye of the needle. And I think all of that's eisegesis. It's not exegesis. Let's just deal with it the way Jesus, I think, meant it. How in the world could a camel, the largest animal they knew in Israel, go through the eye of a needle? Well, I guess you could take that camel, chop him up. I guess you could boil him and boil him and boil him and boil him until he'd be totally 
with fire and boiling and treatment and beating, the camel would be totally liquefied. Okay? Then you take a needle, eye, and I guess you could eventually pour that camel through it. Pretty good task, isn't it? Even with all of our modern methodology of liquefying a camel, to pour a whole camel liquefied through the eye of a needle, Jesus said it's that tough for somebody who has a lot of property, a lot of stuff to get to heaven. Why is that? You see, the more stuff we have, the more time it takes to look after our stuff, yeah. to tend to our stuff. Our stuff has to have priority. We might lose some of our stuff. Or our, our stuff may drop in value. Our, our stuff may be taken away from us. So it's a matter of priority. And, and so we see here, this rich young man looked at Jesus and he said, he's got something I want. But he had everything. He didn't know exactly what Jesus had. He wanted to be on his team. And Jesus said, here's the requirements to be on my team. Here's what you have to do. Sell out. Sell out. So we see what he was looking for in a coach. Jesus had all that. You read Matthew 1 all the way through to Matthew 10, and you'll run into the power of Jesus. Man, no, no, no. The lame walked. The dead. Sarah Mason, why? Brought back to life. Oh, here's somebody who's deaf and dumb. Now they can speak, and there's some here. Here's somebody else who was demon-possessed, epileptic. Now they're healed. And the power was being manifested everywhere. Read Mark 1, all the way through this point. Man, this rich, prestigious young man, he saw power, did he not? Man, that's who I want to coach me. Somebody has that kind of power. I went into a pact with him. And he saw all these characteristics. Jesus was authentic. Read the first part just of Mark. You see shining through a, a light, a glow, an authenticity that can't be faked. Oh, he was authentic. And he was caring. He reached out to a child. They said, get those children out of here. Jesus said, said unless you become like that child, give the children highest priority. He looked at women. In that day, women were just possessions. Take or leave them. Use them. Throw them away. Kick them out. Jesus lofted the female. And he was caring. This Rich guy had never seen anything like that. He was caring. Oh, and he was a teacher. He listened to his words, strange words. Remember what Jesus taught. You don't figure out with common sense. Oh, no. He said, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. He said, those at the bottom, they'll come to the top. Those who are at the top, they'll go to the bottom and this rich young guy, he never heard. This is astounding, his words. He said, man, I'm going to follow him. And then we have to flip it over. We have to say, well, well, what does a life coach look for in someone who's on his team? By the way, there's a dance going on between players and coaches. It starts in high school. Here's somebody who's tremendously gifted. All the schools say we want him. The dance starts. And he decides to go with this college. Signing day, he signs up with this college. He plays collegiate football. He's good enough that the pros want him to play on Sunday. Then he switches around. Then there's draft day. And they go through all the drafts. And then if you're selected, man, you're put on a team. Or if you weren't drafted, you can go prove yourself. And, and maybe it'd be a part of an NFL team. And the contract is signed. And now it's the team who drafts the player, not as in high school, that the player decides to go with this coach and this team. And it's a continual kind of dance that's going on. You've got a team coach, a coach team, and we'll see who will win. And this is in life. We are looking for a coach, and the coach 
is looking for players on his team. And you have a pact we entered in. And we asked the question, what, you know, what, what kind of player is the coach looking for? Oh, somebody who has potential. That's the P. Potential. Potential. And by the way, all of us have potential. And by the way, as a footnote, everybody's been drafted, you see. This is what I believe. Therefore, I'm more Armenian than I am Calvinist. You're going to get theological on me. You get it? Armenians say, man, I decided, you know, for Jesus. Calvin said, oh, no, no, you were picked before the foundation of the world. I say, no, whosoever will may come. This is sort of a part of this. That's a footnote. What does the coach look for? Potential. That's important. We, have pot- we all have potential, do we not? What else does a coach look for? Somebody who is actualized. Somebody who's got some passion, some zip to them. Doesn't mean it's expressed as an extroverted personality or an introverted personality. I've seen extroverts that had a lot in the showroom, not in the stock case. And I've seen a lot of people had a lot in the stock, stock room and nothing in the showcase. I mean, you could be introvert, extrovert, but somebody who, who's got some passion, they, they're actualized. They, they want to see their life get on target. Somebody who has potential, somebody who is actualized, and the C stands, somebody's coachable. Man, you got to be coachable. And we'll talk about that in the future. And there are coachable moments in everybody's life. Coachable moments. Remember the man who was there by the pool of Bethesda, John 5? He'd been there 38 years, waiting the water to be stirred so it'd be healed, and Jesus went up there and asked him the coldest question that you could ask or even the most relevant question. He said, do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? Been there 38 years. He made a living out of being sick by being afflicted. See, but he was at a coachable, teachable moment. Do you want to be healed? The woman called the act of adultery. They were going to stone her, and Jesus said, hey, any of you guys without sin, just fire away, throw those rocks. And they looked around, and Jesus was riding on the ground. We don't know what he was riding. He may have been writing some name, rank, and serial numbers of those guys who had those stones and said, hey, Ooh, and they dropped their stones and they walked away. And Jesus said, no one condemns you. She said, no one, Lord. He says, neither do I condemn you. Teachable moment. You go and sin no more. See, Teachable moment. Now, Jesus was being crucified. Preparation there, the beating, crown of thorns, the shame. What did Jesus say? Not a word. Read it. He didn't say a word. Why? It wasn't a teachable moment. Peter denied Jesus three times. They're prior to the crucifixion. At the crucifixion, he's by the lake. Three questions were asked of him. Three denials, three affirmations. Do you agape love me twice? Finally, do you feel a love me just as a friend? Peter saw where he was. That was a teachable moment. There are teachable moments in your life and my life. Maybe mountaintops or valleys, maybe sickness, maybe health. Boy, it gets our attention. There's a teachable moment. That's when we're coachable. Coachable. So, coach looks for our potential. Somebody, act, somebody actualized. Somebody who is coachable. And somebody who is totally committed. Whoa, time out. Wait a minute. Go back to our rich, gifted young man. What did he lack? One thing. But he kept six commandments perfectly from a childhood. All the relationships that deal in the parallel, person to person. He'd been perfect, but he'd broken the first commandment. Ladies and gentlemen, all the commandments stand on the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God demands that he be number one, and everything stands on that. And Jesus, the life coach of this young man, potentially said, hey, you lack one thing. 
You've got something ahead of God. It's your stuff. Doesn't mean everybody is to sell everything. But anything that you put in the place of or ahead of God, that will keep you from letting Jesus Christ coach your life. Coach your life. You see, this rich guy, this young guy, he was big and he wanted to get bigger. He had everything the world offered, but he saw in Jesus that was something that he needed. And Jesus said, you haven't sold out. You lack this one thing. You've got to take care of this in your life before you can follow me. And he didn't understand a basic biblical principle. Listen carefully. If you want to get bigger, you have to get smaller. Only way you can get bigger is to get smaller. And that's what Jesus was saying. You have to get smaller. This thing that's blocking you from being a follower, get rid of that. Get smaller. Let life be simpler. All your property is compounding your life. You can't follow unless you totally, totally give him everything. You say, well... God wanted to save the world and call the world back to himself. What would he do? He would demonstrate his power, omnipotence. He would demonstrate, demonstrate his presence, omniscience. He would demonstrate his attributes. The world would say, whoa, that is God. What did God do? Luke 2 says, you find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger? You mean <laughs> something that puny as a little bitty babe of common peasant people? You mean that's what God's going to use? You know, see the principle. You want to get bigger, you have to get smaller. You, you, you see it everywhere. Remember how the first computers, have you read about the first computer? First computer came out, it covered a whole warehouse. <laughs> it was humongous. Only two or three people could operate it. It was slow, it was clumsy. Boy, it was a computer. And now look at computers, little micro computers. They're more powerful than, than that gigantic computers and they're getting smaller and smaller well, they'll have more and more power, right? Telephones, smaller and smaller. John Hagler, quantum physicist, recent in a lecture made an astounding statement. He said, the smallest, smallest unit in the known universe get that, the smallest unit in the known universe is more Powerful, it has more energy than the billions of galaxies and the millions of suns in the solar system. Did you get that? Smallest unit, more energy than the whole shooting match of creation. Whew. Those quantum physicists are way ahead of the game, aren't they? You see, in order to get bigger, we have to get smaller, a biblical principle. Which would you rather have? 223 committees to change the world or the Apostle Paul? Hmm? Hmm? Which one? Which would you rather have, the Apostle John or 10 books of regulations and rules and strategies as to how this world could be turned over to the Lord. Which one do you rather have? Just one little guy or all those rule books? Put another way, which would you rather have, a whole army military trained of Goliaths or one David? Which one do you rather have? Hmm? You see, this rich young peacock hadn't figured it out. He thought, man, I'm big now with all of I have, all my possession. I'm young and I'm moral. Man, I've got it all. And, and Jesus said to him, no, if you're going to let me coach you up, you're going to get small. 
And as you get small, then in God's economy, you become big, big. We are all in the process of building a home. Whether we're just starting out or we've been at it for years, building a home never ends. It requires constant improvements, but it all starts with its foundation. In this 90-day devotional, Cardinal Rules for a Happy Home, Dr. Ed Young uses decades of preaching, counseling, and life experiences to provide clear and practical insights for building a strong foundation for your own happy home. Each devotional contains a Bible passage, practical applications, and guided prayer time to help you build your home on wisdom, understanding, and the love of God. To get a copy for yourself or someone you love, call the number on your screen or go online at winningwalk.org. It's our gift to you for your financial support of this ministry. With just 15 minutes a day, you could be on your way to a happy home. Most every year, people make some type of New Year's resolution. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to eat better. And on and on it goes. This is a new year, a time for fresh beginnings. Start this year by building into your schedule a DQT. That stands for daily quiet time. A DQT is a time that we need to set aside every day to spend with the Lord. We read the Bible, we pray and listen to Him. It's the most important part of every day. We have written a devotional that will help you begin a DQT in your life. Every day you'll get a scripture, a brief thought and a prayer delivered right to your tablet, smartphone or computer. It's easy to read wherever you are. To get your devotional, go to our website winningwalk.org and sign up for the devotional. It is a simple way to make that DQT a built-in, regular, scheduled part of your life. It will change everything, guaranteed.